15 and will help you get your message out. Go to R15 and sign in. Push the button on the R15 and website and you'll be connected to a random person from your community. R15 and will then create an ad hoc telephone free, connecting random community members. As the community works together to spread the message, R15 and creates community engagement. There's no charge to you or your community. Try R15 and today. The revolutionization of communication. So please, uh, please call that number. We need you to subscribe so that there's a good density of, uh, of people and, uh, and we'll uh, initiate some broadcasts. Uh, I'm Dimitri Kleiner. Uh, that's my email address. That's my website. That's uh, you know, how you can follow me on, on Twitter and stuff and other things. Um, so Telekommunisten is a collective based in Berlin uh, and our work is centered around uh, the idea of the social relations embedded in communication technologies. So communication technologies um, are, are platforms that mediate to, between people and mediate relationships and these, and these platforms and the way they're designed and the topologies they have are deeply related to the political systems and the economic systems uh, that we have and produce very, very specific outcomes. So we make several artworks that, uh, that investigate these relationships, R15N being one of them here, that that video introduced, uh, introduced you to, and we'll talk more about that as we go through. Um, and as the video said, R15N is a telephone tree. Um, a telephone trees are a technology that were used quite often. Some of you may remember them back before online communications uh, uh, were popular. They were used by uh, like the military, by community groups, by schools, by activists and political campaigns. And the way they worked was the community would have lists and so the organization would call like the first five people on the list and then they would call, they would, they would also have a list, they would call five people and they would call five people and they would call five people and so forth until the, until the information was passed through through the community. And this wasn't a recorded message, this was really individual people talking to each other. And there's a lot of reasons we find this platform interesting, so we decided to, to recreate it, to bring this back to life, except that with R15N, uh, it keeps the list for you, so you don't have to worry about uh, having a, a list of people. You just uh, call that number, and uh, the system will make the tree take care of itself, make all the phone calls. And this is interesting to us on a number of levels. On the, on the, first, on the first very simple level, um, it's, it's interesting because people are not used to talking to each other on the phone anymore. This is something that we found almost very early on from, from the system, like that people are interested in platforms that have, you know, they use text and they use like SMS and these very short messages and they communicate in this very kind of informal, very quick, very impersonal way. And when they're actually put on the telephone to each other, all of a sudden this feels like a very intimate kind of awkward relationship. And this is a very interesting thing to us as well because it shows kind of the way that uh, even though uh, on one sense, social networking platforms enable you to have relationships with hundreds and hundreds of people. These relationships are actually very weak and, and, and the ability to have more intimate relationships is actually damaged. Um, but this is, this is kind of a side theme. The main theme for us is, of course, that it demonstrates the issues with centralization. Because a, a, a lot of our work and a lot of our texts talk about how the internet started out as this decentralized process and through the, and through, and through the process of capitalization of the internet, the process of capital coming in and becoming the major, the major player in its development, it became more centralized. And often people don't think about the path information takes when they communicate. They just think that it's coming from me to that person. They don't really think about so much in between. Well, by putting you in between, by making it a phone tree where you actually have to receive the information and pass the information on, uh, this, this to us very clearly kind of uh, helps people think of information and how it flows through networks. And you know that when, when you get a message, you're not obliged necessarily to pass it on. You can change it. You can invent your own message or you can just simply refuse to pass it on, right? In the same way that centralized platforms have that kind of power when you communicate, when you communicate through them. And there's also an interesting social economic dimension to the platform um, in that the mobile phones are the most common technology in the world. More people have access to mobile phones than any other medium, so it's a very ubiquitous technology that's available everywhere. But nonetheless, the relationships with the networks are very, are very much asynchronous. For instance, in the West, 
mobile phones are sort of marketed very much as a freedom enabling device where you have your mobile phone, you can be anywhere, call anybody, communicate everybody. So like, you know, especially early, early, early mobile phone advertising had, had a lot of like businessmen doing their work on the beach and stuff like that because, you know, it just shows this, this freedom kind of a platform where in, in a lot of parts of the world, like especially the poor parts of the world, people have mobile phones, but they don't actually have any credit. So actually they can't make any phone calls. They carry the phone not to enable their own freedom, but because their parents, their employers, their teachers, the authority figures in their lives insist that they carry the phone so they can control them, right? So they're actually, they're actually uh, control devices that, uh, that, tether, that tether the people to their, um, to their masters, so to speak, to their superiors. And so, and so this, this aspect is also very interesting in R15N because all the phone calls are incoming calls. So actually R15N uh, can be used whether or not you have any phone credit. So it's a, it's a broadcast communication system that doesn't require you to have any phone credit. Um, it is of course a, uh, an economic fiction like, uh, like all the work, so all of the networks there that, uh, that we've created that I'll touch on briefly, not in as much depth because R15N is the, is the exhibition today, but we call a lot of our works economic fiction because they're not science fiction, they work, technologically speaking, they function, so the science is not the fictional part, but just like in science fiction, for the science and science fiction to become a reality, the sci science has to transcend its conditions of the period when the fiction was written. So for the things in science fiction to become real, science has to transcend the state of when the original work was imagined. In the same th way, these are economic fictions. In order, for them to, in order for them to exist, we have to transcend our current economic limitations because these systems, being free, being open, and being against the socioeconomic model uh, that capitalism imposes on communication uh, mechanisms cannot exist because they cannot be funded outside of this art context. So they're, they're, perform it's a, they're, they're a performative fiction. They can exist here and for us and in these playful environments, but these kinds of topologies that we experiment with are actually fictional. Another one is Thimble. That's the uh, one with the finger. Uh, Thimble was, uh, was shown at, at, at uh, Transmediala last year. It was our contribution last year. And Thimble is a, a microblogging platform. Does everybody here know what a microblogging platform is, like Twitter? Right, so uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, a lot of people thinking about decentralized decentralized microblogging platforms or decentralized social media in general. And uh, from the from our point of view, the internet was always decentralized. Right, from the very from the very the whole point of the the internet is a decentralized social platform. That's actually what it is. And things like Usenet and IRC and Finger um, and email have been allowing people to share photos and post status updates and, and, and share information for the entire time the internet has existed. So the question is not really how to build a decentralized social media platform. The question rather is how did we wind up with decentralized platforms? Like how did we wind up with like from starting from a totally decentralized social media platform called the internet, which is what it is, how do we wind up with Facebook and Twitter, and YouTube and these very centralized platforms? And the answer of course is, uh, is the logic of capitalism, which we'll go over in more detail later. But um, so Thimble demonstrates this by creating a decentralized social media platform using uh, protocols from the 1970s. So it's based around the finger protocol, which, which, was a, which was how status updates were posted on the internet in the 1970s. Finger started out as a uh, campus area user information system uh, where people updated their dot project and dot plan files to post status updates, much the way they do with Twitter right now and then eventually became a distributed TCP based service which is the state that it still remains. So the actual finger daemon that we use for our own Thimble host is, uh, it hasn't had a single like software update in like over a decade. It's uh, very stable, right? And DeadSwap is another, uh, another one of the platforms that, uh, that we did at the Aarhus uh, University at the Susvalens Festival. And it is, uh, it is meant to, it is meant to um, sort of be an analysis and a critique of circumvention systems because uh, the topic of the festival was surveillance. And in the hacker community, in the media arts community, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of projects that attempt to create circumvention systems, projects like Tor um, and other kinds of things that, that imagine themselves as allowing people to uh, escape the surveillance of their oppressive regimes so they can kind of like organize revolution in, 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 in secret spaces and you know destroy Death Star. And, uh, and this is uh, 
uh, for me, a problematic understanding of activism and a problematic understanding of, uh, of, of what, how difficult it is to actually, be, to actually be secret. So we created a platform to kind of help people get that. And it's a, it's a file sharing system that only exists on one USB stick. And, and, and you take this USB stick and you can upload files to it and you can download files from it. And there's a little wiki where you can post messages and, and update, update files. Um, and then you take this USB stick and you hide it somewhere in public space. So under a garbage can somewhere, under a park bench, in the corner of a cafe. Then you send a text message to an anonymous text message interface and you, you say where you've hidden it. And then this text message is forwarded to the next person in the network. So the, the, the next person is supposed to interact with it. And then they get this text message and they have to go and find it. And then they can upload and download files and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And then they send a text message where, where it is. So it's, uh, so it's a dark net, but it's, uh, but it's a very physical one. And it's, uh, it sounds really kind of easy, but uh, people find out that it's actually really very hard to be a, a good secret agent. Um, Right, so the Telecommunist Manifesto is this book here. It's also available, it's also available online. And this, uh, this is um, more or less what we're going to talk about now. So we often use the word communism. In our, I'm, I'm in the wrong place, right? We often use the word, <laughs> we often use the word uh, communism in, uh, in, in, our, in our work. And um, it's important to understand what we mean by that. And uh, communism does not refer to the form of government of historical or contemporary communist states. Uh, even the leaders of those states would never have claimed that those were communist states. They would only have claimed that they were attempting to achieve communism, and they never have. So communism is not a place that's ever existed, but it's a, theoretical, it's a theoretical society. It's a theoretical society with no classes and no state. And it's one that's never been achieved, but that's what it means in theory. So it doesn't refer to anything historical. The term originates in the British and French collectivist uh, and cooperative movements, such as the followers of Robert Owen. In the beginning, it was a very kind of primitive um, uh, movement without any kind of really strong social theory. It was more or less, it was more or less this idea of uh, cooperatives, people working together, like uh, starting their own like cooperative textile mills, like Robert Owen did, and, and things like that. So it was uh, it was it was it was very it was very open concept that just uh, more or less meant uh, together owning things together as opposed to having like a, a relationship where somebody else owns the things that you need to live and work. And likewise, capitalism does not refer to the free market, enterprise, business, entrepreneurship, or liberal democracy, despite the fact that it's often used that way in the media. It doesn't mean any of those things. Capitalism refers to a society in which the owners of capital are able to abstain from direct production by appropriating the products of workers who employ their property in production. So capitalism is a mode of production and it implies a relationship between workers and capitalists. So the capitalists own the things that the workers need in order to produce and share and they are able to earn an income by doing so. That's so that's how we use the word. We're not talking about any country or any particular place. Right, and capitalism uh, was not invented by Forbes magazine, and it was not invented in a positive sense. Capitalism was actually invented as a critical term, and it, it, it originates among the Ricardian socialists, the early critics of political economy, and it was intended to draw a correlation with feudalism. So, so the Ricardian socialists were the first people to, to begin to formulate a kind of a scientific uh, socialism or communism. They, uh, they followed the works of David Ricardo and they took his interpretations and they applied them. So David Ricardo was a capitalist. And remember, capitalism was once itself a contesting class. It was once itself an underclass that was contesting for supremacy against feudalism. So the early capitalists were themselves critical thinkers in a sense because they were criticizing the feudal class. And so David Ricardo constructed, constructed a theory of class struggle where he illustrated how the landlord um, the interests of the landlord class were against the interest of everybody else. Uh, and so, and what the early Ricardian socialists did was they took that model, the Ricardian model, and they turned it around. They said, well, if the landlords are exploiting everybody by owning land, the capitalists are also ex exploiting everybody by owning capital. And the word capitalism was derived from that. It was meant to draw a relationship with feudalism. So it was a negative term from the start. It was never used in a positive way until, until, quite, until quite recently. Right. Uh, and here's a quote from Thomas Hodgkins, one of the Ricardian socialists, where he, uh, where he lays out the essential 
the essential argument that socialism, communism comes from, that the lawgiver and the capitalist always compare our wages with the wages of other laborers and without adverting to what we produce. So, so the, the, theory, the theory that the working class produces a surplus value that is appropriated by capital and that, and, that, and, that, and that they're paid not based on the value that they create, but based on their replacement costs, based on, based on what it costs to sustain them as workers. That's, uh, that's the argument that you see Thomas Hodgkins um, laying out here. Note that that's 1825. Right? So, both economies and networks are composed of relationships. As Tatiana mentioned earlier, a network is a set of relationships. An economy is also a set of relationships, just like a network. And relationships in a network define the topology of the network. So when you talk about the topology of a network, what you mean is what are the relationships between the various things that interact on that network? Right? Relationship, relationships in an economy define the mode of production. So when you talk about a mode of production, you're talking about what are the relationships between the various actors Within that, within that economic system. In, in networking, we talk about uh, various different kinds of network topologies. I'm going to focus on two broad kinds, because this is not meant to educate you on networking, but, uh, but um, the most theoretical type. So a mesh network is a network where all participants can interact, where every, every, every participant on that network can interact with every other network without any mediation, which means that any node that happens to be in between those two nodes doesn't in any way interfere with that information. It, it, just, it just passes it through directly, and often, there's not even, often they can communicate directly with each other without any node in the middle at all. But the network just simply passes information between all participants in a neutral fashion. The internet is such a network, right? Authorization in this, in this kind of a network is always based on mutual configuration, because without any centralization, the what can be exchanged, what kind of interactions can take place between the nodes of the network are subject to the configuration of both those things. So the mutual, mutual approval that this kind of interaction is, is wanted by both, by both sides, right? And each participant is autonomous. So each participant in the network uh, is completely in control of their, own, of their own host, their own information, their own communication systems. Now star networks, are different kinds of networks. The star network is called the star network because it has a center node, and all of the other participants are like rays of a star extending from the center node, and they all come into the center node. So all communication has to go through that center node, right? So all interactions between participants is mediated. No two participants on that network can communicate except through that central node, right? Just like we we're talking about R15N, when the message comes through you, you have complete control of whether to pass that message on. In a star network, there is one node, it's not a tree, it's a star, so there's one node where all, all information goes through, and that node always has the right to approve or deny any kind of communication between the network to track what's going on, to you know, allow or deny any storage of information or access to information, right? And authorization is, of course, always granted by the operator of that middle node. So the operator of the, star, of the, of the network can control who is authorized to do what, right? And each participant is dependent on the operator. So the participants can only do what the operator allows. Now, communism, back to modes of production, is a network where all participants are equal, or is an economy where all participants are equal. Producers retain everything they produce. Participants produce for social value and not an exchange value. So things are made because they're considered to be useful by the people that make them, not because they have value in exchange, because there's no profits being extracted. And exchange is based on mutual respect. So there's no, there's, there's no, there's no basis there's no, it's not based on profit, they're based on mutual respect. Right? And in capitalism, participants are divided into classes. Property owners appropriate wealth from producers. And, partic and participants produce for exchange value. So the logic of capitalism, because investors invest money in order to capture profit, is that what they invest in it needs to capture exchange value in order for them to recuperate their investment and thus reproduce their capital. And exchange is based on market price. So price mediates how things are exchanged. Right? So capitalists love star networks, because in a star network, the capitalist is the operator. Roles and credentials create classes. If you ever had an account on a central system, you know that some people are administrators, some people have different rights. So by having a centralized platform, you end up with classes of users that have different privileges based on what they've been assigned by the operator. 
And mediation is required to charge a price. If there's no, if there's no ability to, be interact, if, to come in between the users, if you can't control their interaction and their data, you also can't monetize that relationship. In order, in order to charge a price, you have to be in the middle of the relationship, which a star network allows you to do. Right? Capitalists hate mesh networks because participants can interact directly, so there's no place for the cash box, there's no place for, there's no place for the doorman or the, or, the, or the cover charge, right? There's no toll gates, no prices, and there's no privilege, no control. You can't stop participants from interacting with each other, so you can't, you can't, have, a, you can't have a set of privileges that differentiate them from each other, right? So the internet. We all know the internet. We've probably been using it for many years. The internet was not created by capitalists. It was developed by universities, NGOs, hobbyists, and the military. And of course, all of those people were not creating it for exchange value, right? They were creating it because they needed it. Even the, even the military, even if they need it for evil things like killing people, they, they still were not creating it for exchange value. They were creating it for, for their needs, their communication needs, right? But capitalists weren't uh, you know, just doing nothing. They weren't sitting idly aside. Capitalists were also actively excited about the potential of online systems. They created something called online services, which uh, some of you may remember as being called CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy. These were huge platforms uh, um, in the early 90s and earlier that were, that were used by all kinds of people who were very well funded, had lots of money, huge data centers, and briefly were very, were very, very important. Right? Until the 90s, major corporations had no real internet strategy because to them, this was the online world, CompuServe, of AOL, Prodigy. This internet stuff was something that you know, students were using in universities and was for hobbyists and NGOs. It wasn't serious business. Right? Now, capitalist online services were client server systems that employ a star topology. Right? The internet was host to numerous peer-to-peer -peer systems such as email, Usenet, IRC, which depend on a mesh topology. So in the 90s, both these systems kind of existed side by side. You had, you had the capitalist world investing and developing CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy, and those sorts of things. And then you had this kind of non-capitalist world, this strange alliance of people that needed different communication tools to solve different problems that were creating this kind of hodgepodge internet. Right? Now, because the internet is a peer system, anybody with a connection to it can also connect others. That's one of the powerful things about the way the internet was built, is that anybody with a connection to the internet could connect everybody else to the internet too, because, because of the way the TCP IP works and the DNS system and everything else, right? And so all of a sudden this created a boom of internet service providers, because the, 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 the relative cost, the regulative capital required to open an internet service provider was really very small. So all of a sudden, they just exploded in every, in every street corner, and this caught the capitalists totally by surprise. They were not expecting this, because they were like, what is this silly internet? We have, you know, our, we've spent millions of dollars on CompuServe and AOL and Prodigy. You know, who wants, uh, who wants this? But yet, because of the very structure of the network, it had explosive growth. Right? And the exchange, it's, it's important to understand the exchange value these ISPs were capturing was collectively created. So the, the, the actual economics of the internet, the early internet, was much different than what we had on CompuServe, AOL, and stuff like that. Right? The value of the network comes from the size of the network because people want to be on a network where other people are on. So the more other people are on the network, the more value that network has. Right? Now, communism loves a mesh network. Each ISP was independently earning income by being a part of a common platform, not owned, not owned by anybody as a whole, but composed of the mutual interactions of the participants. Right? So this does not resemble a market economy, but rather a network economy. Unlike, unlike AOL and Prodigy, which competed against each other based on investing in tools, so like AOL might say, we're better than CompuServe because we have better chat or we have better, we have better messaging system or something like that. They would, they, they would have their own programmers, they would invest money into differentiating themselves from the, other, from the other online services. Whereas in the ISPs, we're selling the same internet. There was no, there was no difference between the internet one ISP was selling or the internet another ISP was selling. They were just selling access to the internet. And the value of the internet was not from what any one ISP was contributing to it, but from the size of the network that all of these interconnected ISPs had created. Right. And capitalism hates competition. Uh, for instance, this is Arthur Quinning Hadley from 1885. 
uh, saying railroad competition may exist everywhere, somewhere, or nowhere. If it exists everywhere, rates are reduced to the level of movement charges, variable cost, and there is nothing to pay fixed charges, right? So what he means is that competitive railway network cannot afford capital, fixed costs. Hadley was working for a guy you may have heard of called J.P. Morgan, who was waging a war against the destructive competition to consolidate the railways. The build-out of the railway networks is actually very similar to the build-out of the public information systems. Like with the early railways were very much publicly financed with land grants, tax breaks, and outright, outright financial grants given to the railway, um, early railway companies, but then as the railway became more free and open, as Hadley was saying, without, when, there's no, when, there's, when there's too much competition, there's no, there's no way to capture enough money to, to rebuild um, the capital, to build out the network. You can only get enough money to handle the actual moving of the trains, so the network deteriorates. Without public funds, the network can't, the network can't survive in an open competitive environment. So J.P. Morgan used his huge financial and political clout to centralized control of the network and created the robber barons and was himself was so consolidated the network and centralized it in, this, in the hands of a few companies in exactly the same way at the internet. So the capitalists have seen this before. It's not the first time they've, 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 seen, they've seen a network that they couldn't capitalize. And they know what to do with it. So they weren't happy about the internet. This was like not something they wanted. So they just bought everything. Right? They, bought the entire, they bought the entire thing. Right. And we, we remember this as the dot-com boom, where all, where, all of a, where all of a sudden the financial markets were inflated to huge, huge degrees, asset bubbles were sent through the roof while they just simply went through like in a very quick process of literally buying everything. And if you had internet access in the mid-90s, some of you may have access in the mid-90s, it was usually from a mom and pop ISB with a, fel with a shelf full of consumer grade modems. So it was, some, it was some small neighborhood company that had a bunch of modems and then a, a connection somewhere. And this was who you were buying your internet access from in the mid 90s. Today, it's mostly provided by giant telecommunication conglomerates. So this initial enclosure of simply buying everything largely worked. Today, the actual physical structure of the internet is virtually completely in the hands of a very small handful of very large corporations like Verizon and uh, many others. Right. But this was still not enough because the network was still this peer-to-peer -peer network. Even though they owned the whole thing, it was still a peer-to-peer -peer network. People could still do what they wanted and there was still no clear way for them to make any money off of it as we saw in the dot-com bust. They couldn't understand how so much user freedom can be used to capture profit. It wasn't didn't jive with their mentality. So the second, the second uh, stage Communism had to be driven from the network. And this is what we, we, we know as Web 2.0, or the birth of social media, right? Because the web is actually a client-server platform. Unlike all of the other traditional uh, platforms on the internet, like email, IRC, Finger, Usenet, and so forth, the web is actually a client-server platform. It operates over the internet, but it is not itself a peer-to-peer -peer platform. It has a centralized server, the web server, and all of the clients connect to the centralized server. Right? So it imposes a star topology over top of the peer-to-peer -peer internet. And so Usenet became replaced by web forms, email became replaced by social media, IRC by Twitter example, and of course even even converging, it's even hard to divide it so much because something like Facebook is at the same time messaging, instant messaging, chat, groups, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's sort of re-centralizing and massifying uh, this formerly decentralized and distributed platform, right? And the core innovation of the internet, peer-to-peer, -peer, in the 90s, every tech magazine and every tech television show was raving about the huge possibilities of peer-to-peer -peer technology and distributed computing. It was really like the base of so much excitement uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the tech world. People, everybody would have intelligent agents constantly collecting information, and we'd have so much control and autonomy, and like, you know, like, the such powerful tools to ensure democracy because of this completely uncontrollable distributed decentralized networks it was a very, very positive term. Now, you hardly ever, ever hear the term P2P except as a negative term. It's become a criminalized term. P2P, P2P has become a contraband somehow. It's something that's used by thieves, pirates, and other criminals. Like the only way you'd want to use a peer-to-peer -peer technology was if you were like a thief or something, right? 
And it's being engineered out of the internet because the web doesn't need it. The web doesn't require the internet. The web is a client-server platform, so it can work over a network that's not a mesh network, unlike the other platforms. Right? And of course, the issue comes back to venture capitalism. You know, because of the privileged access to accumulate wealth, capitalists capture the wealth of, fut of the future by offering each generation of innovators a chance to become a junior partner in their club, exchanging the future value of what they create for the present wealth they need to get started. So if you have a great new idea for a telecommunication platform, you have no way on your own to actually realize that platform. You have no way to finance the creation of that platform and the support and distribution um, of it, and especially if you're talking about a platform that's intended to su support billions and billions of people on the planet. The only way you can do that is by, is by getting money from venture capital. And if you get money from venture capital, then it comes with strings attached because it has to, it has to have a plausible way that the venture capitalists are going to make profit of it. So in this process, they, the dead stolen value of the past captures the unborn value of the future. So it's a self-perpetuating problem well, it will, where each new system that gets developed is, uh, is also centralized, also creates value. That value is retained by the capitalists to enable them to capture the next wave of innovation as well. And if we are to have a free society modeled after pure networks, free software, gift economies, and the pastoral commons, we need to find a way for innovation to be itself born free. And that's, and that's, and that's uh, quite a difficult challenge. Because like in the early 90s, when we, a lot of us, when we first encountered the internet, we were excited about it for reasons that went far beyond simple technology. We were excited about it for political and for cultural reasons because we really, we really, we really felt the sorts of relationships that we were, that we were struggling for in other areas, in, in activist and in cultural struggle, were actually architected into the, into the way the system worked. So here was a network that was an existential threat to the capitalist system because it engineered inside its, inside its architecture a completely new way of interacting. And, and, and this, was, this was something that was quite exciting. But it proved to be incompatible with capitalism because capitalism requires enclosure. Without privileged access to scarce resources, it cannot capture profit. And if we can't find alter alternatives to capitalist financing, it is not only the internet as we know it that we will lose, but also the chance to remake society in its image. Right? So also the chance to actually change the kinds, of, the kinds of relationships we have in culture and in society broadly because, because that is the kind of promise that it once held. And that's, uh, that's the end of the presentation. And if you have any questions, let me know. But uh, can we get the Thimble video? We also, made, we also made a video for Thimble. I think that it would be a good closing to close with the, uh, the Thimble project. That, again, is the microblogging platform uh, built exclusively on protocols from the 1970s. One second. This is how we try to incorporate some of these ideas into the artistic projects that we, that we do. <laughs>